Today I'm going to talk a little bit about my work in freshwater storytelling. So for a great majority of the life on the planet, freshwater is essential for survival. The rivers and streams and wetlands and lakes that shape the surface of our planet are really the foundation of life as we know it. And from food and energy to the core of our well-being as humans, we all have, or freshwater is beyond just a natural resource. It's really vital to our existence. And because of this, we're all naturally deeply connected to these ecosystems. Whether it's clean water or recreation or even power, we all have these connections. And it's really these connections and values that really help shape how we interact with these freshwater environments and ultimately influence our decisions to want to conserve them. So my personal connection with the world of freshwater and ultimately my drive to want to, to document and conserve these, these ecosystems was, was fostered by my experiences and connections. Growing up, I was really fortunate to grow up in Colorado along the banks of the Colorado Cachalpoota River. And from a very early age, I explored the river, you know, looking for species like turtles and snakes and amphibians like these northern leopard frogs. And then trying to learn about all the critters that crossed my path. And emulating some of the underwater adventures that I read about in books and magazines, my adventures eventually led me to go below the surface. However, living in Colorado, I didn't have an ocean to explore, so places like rivers really became my source for underwater explorations. And some of my first spots that I tried to get underwater were actually in the icy cold headwaters of Colorado's high country. And so captivated, captivated by these underwater worlds, my interest eventually led me on the path to wanting to study them in college. And it wasn't until I was in college where I really started to get an appreciation and understanding of the diversity that lived in freshwater environments. Many of my classes introduced me to a diversity of life that I thought was only possible in marine ecosystems. You know, many of the species I was learning about, I had never heard about and definitely had never seen images of them. Species like paddlefish and, and bowfin and, and images are species like these, these giant sturgeon here. And college was also the point where I picked up my first camera. And this was really also the first point where I started to see the power as, of photography as a, as a tool for creating awareness surrounding freshwater conservation. But I also began to realize that there was very little documentation of freshwater life in its natural habitat. Now, as a young aspiring photographer, I scoured the images of, you know, pages of publications like National Geographic, trying to learn and absorb as much as possible. But even with all, as inspiring as that imagery was, very rarely did I see freshwater portrayed the way that I knew it to be when I'd seen it underwater. So as I continued on college, eventually moving on to research, um, continuing photography along the way, I was very fortunate in that I got to, to experience freshwater environments and the communities that were connected to those environments all over the world. And through my experiences, I often saw this reoccurring theme in that whether people know it or not, they all have these deep connections and values with freshwater. However, very few people actually realize how special these ecosystems are from a diversity perspective. There's often this huge disconnect between what people think lives in freshwater and this great diversity that's actually there. And so I also began to recognize that my images really had the potential to have a greater impact than my science alone. Being able to photograph some of the, the species I was working on, like rough skinned newts, was kind of fundamental for not only gaining awareness for these unknown species, but also fundamental for, for creating awareness surrounding freshwater conservation. And so these realizations eventually led me on the path to become a photographer and filmmaker and move out of the science. So unlike marine environments, freshwater has never had a, a Jacques Cousteau or an inspired renaissance of visual artists and photographers and filmmaker, filmmakers to help celebrate kind of the aesthetics and diversity that live in these, these habitats. And with most public perceptions of freshwater often limited to you know, what people catch on the end of their fishing line, I began to see that the challenge to create awareness surrounding freshwater life was often limited to how it was portrayed. So since 2011, I had the great fortune to begin working with a company called Freshwaters Illustrated. And Freshwaters Illustrated is a nonprofit that through the use of photography and video, we work to facilitate in a foundation of a public who has a greater understanding of freshwater life and a greater appreciation for freshwater conservation. And by creating large media campaigns that combine both photography and video, and working strategically with conservation organizations that work to conserve rivers, we've had great success in engaging local and global audiences, teaching people about not only the freshwater life that's out there, but also 
you know, things they can do in their day-to-day -day lives to be better river stewards, to be better freshwater stewards. We've also had to really figure out over the last couple of years how to work in these environments. So there's a lot of tools out there that have been developed for marine ecosystems. And sometimes that stuff doesn't work well in the freshwater. So we've had to adapt a lot of these, these tools to work in, in places like rivers and streams and, and wetlands and lakes. And camera technology has actually played a, a huge role in this. You know, small cameras like DSLRs and Sony's new mirrorless cameras are kind of crucial to the work we do, not only because they're small and allow us to work in these, these tough environments, but also because they allow us to take both photo and video at the same time. And that's really crucial when you're putting together these kind of image campaigns that combine both photo and video. Being able to do that on the same tool is, is, is priceless. I've also had to really think about how I want to portray freshwater life. And so I really think about illustrating freshwater as an ecosystem, similar to what you might see as of an image of a coral reef. Making sure that you know, my images are truly storytelling, showing not only the species, but the interesting behaviors they exhibit. And in the context of all that, trying to show all of this within the landscapes that these, or these species inhabit. And one of my favorite ways to do that is actually through split level um, shots, where you can actually show the terrestrial and freshwater ecosystem. And this is often very important because most people don't realize how these, these ecosystems are actually very connected. So being able to show that in one image is actually very useful. So oftentimes when I describe my work as an underwater photographer, people often assume that I work in marine ecosystems, swimming in remote coral reefs or diving with sharks and whales. When I tell them I actually work more in ecosystems like this, I usually get a lot of confused looks, followed by, you know, what would you film or photograph in those ecosystems? And that question is really the base of why I do what I do. You know, from from the surface, freshwater environments definitely come across as somewhat bare. You know, definitely not the ecosystems most think of having this great biodiversity. However, you put on a mask and snorkel and dip your head below the surface, and do we introduce to some of those fascinating creatures and captivating worlds that are on this planet? These environments are true spectacles of biodiversity, hosting a collage of shapes and colors and behaviors, and supporting an assemblage of life that is arguably just as diverse as marine ecosystems. Just looking at fish diversity alone, freshwater supports, supports over 40% of the fish on this planet, yet only represents 1% of the water on this planet. It's also estimated that over 126,000 species rely on fresh water. So when people ask me why I work in fresh water, it's with great excitement that I tell them that these are some of the most biodiverse ecosystems on our planet. So across the globe, there are these hidden underwater worlds that flourish with life, many of them right in our own backyards. And because they're below the surface, most people don't know they exist. And one of the great examples I like to share with people about some of these ecosystems is the worlds of uh, southeastern US, places like Tennessee and North Carolina and Georgia. And these are places that most people don't often think of as having this great diversity. But these rivers and streams actually support the world's richest fish, um, tempered fish fauna, and also have the greatest diversity of freshwater mussels, crayfish, snails, and salamanders on this planet. So these, these, these rivers are full of life. And in springtime, you have these incredible behaviors that start to happen where these fish turn on incredible colors and all of them coming together to spawn. And this is actually a result of a fish that built a nest by carrying rock stones. And you can see they basically create this pyramid type nest. And a lot of, because it's the right size gravel, a lot of other species of fish will come here to lay their eggs. And a lot of those orange fish you're seeing will turn on their colors. Usually they start out as silver and brown, but when they start to breed, they turn on these crazy colors like oranges and yellows. And Oftentimes you see blues and greens and pinks. Another extremely colorful group of fish that's found in this area and are very diverse are the darters. And like you can see, fish like these, you know, you'd be more often to see or you'd think you'd see them in a marine ecosystem rather than in a riverbed. And this region is also home to the greatest diversity of salamanders on the planet, including one of the most fascinating animals that I've had the pleasure to photograph, the hellbender salamander. And these salamanders are almost two feet long and are covered with these wrinkly folds of skin. Really a fascinating and, and weird animal. And they're also completely aquatic. So they're completely dependent on you know, health of the water that is within the streams that they live in and also the health of the watershed. 
And because of this, these animals are great ambassadors for teaching people about you know, things they can do to not only conserve hellbenders and learn about the conservation of hellbenders, but also learn about things they can do to help freshwater and be better like freshwater and river stewards. And hellbenders are just one of the great examples of, of how using freshwater life can be a really important tool in captivating local audiences, engaging them with freshwater issues. I've actually witnessed this firsthand many times working in the south. I have a lot of, a lot of times snorkeling when you're with a large underwater camera, people have lots of questions about what you're doing. And I've actually shown farmers and people, local people that have lived on a stretch of river their entire life, pictures of colorful fish and salamanders like this one that they had no idea existed. And a lot of times people are just blown away from this. You know, these people have lived on this river their entire life and had no idea these animals existed. And this starts a dialogue often. You, people understand why water is important or clean water is important. But when you can really start to connect why healthy populations of this salamander or this fish that they just learned about is potentially connected to clean water, people start to get a better understanding for why the diversity is important. And some of them start to think about the decisions they make to impact these environments. And this is especially important because as our human populations continue to grow, Freshwater environments will be continually, continually altered to kind of aid this rising demand. And these impacts are often a serious threat to the diversity that lives in these waters. And because of the vulnerability of freshwater, the species, or the rate of loss of species in these, in these ecosystems is actually greater than that of terrestrial and marine ecosystems. And it's estimated that almost a third of all freshwater species are faced with extinction or threatened with extinction. And hundreds have already been lost. And a lot of this, even in the southern Appalachians, where some of the most rich and diverse rivers in, the, in North America occur, rivers like the Clinch River here, occur in some of the most human dominated landscapes in the US. So you can see here the Clinch River, one of the most diverse in terms of fish diversity, mussel diversity, occurs right next to places like these giant power plants. And this is some of the diversity that's affected by these. And so snorkeling in the Clinch is probably one of the hot spots for freshwater mussels in the world. You'll get an end, into these rivers when you get into them, and it's almost like you feel like you're going into a coral reef. There's millions of mussels covering the, the river floor. There's, there's fish and turtles and snakes everywhere. And these mussels have really interesting behaviors where this one here has actually captured a fish as a, basically a host to put its young on the fish, and then the fish, it'll let it go, and the fish swims off, and from there, the mussel is actually able to disperse its young. So there's actually these really interesting behaviors and these really cool species, but most of them, like this species here, is actually in, on the endangered species list. And you can see that the threat of extinction is real and imminent for many of these species. So throughout my travels, I've, I've witnessed firsthand many of the impacts that come from, from the effects that we, we place on these environments. And even with all this burden, there's still a great deal of hope. And one of the most inspiring parts of what I do isn't actually working with the species themselves, but it's working with the passionate individuals that work to conserve these animals. It's their efforts and passion that really drive me to want to do what I do. And one of the things I often hear from these individuals is that their tough, toughest obstacle for them is often the lack of awareness. You know, nobody knows these species exist. Even in places like the Pacific Northwest in the US where rivers and salmon and, and fishing are very much a part of the culture, there's many fish species that are being lost and being, that are relatively unnoticed. Species like Pacific lamprey, a fish whose evolutionary time scale predates that of dinosaurs, has been lost for much of its historic range. Now these fish, which have a life history similar to salmon, and are arguably just as important to salmon in many of the rivers, have squeezed through 450 million years of environmental change and great extinctions only to be stopped by impacts like dams. Now, fortunately for these fish, there's a growing movement of people to help restore a lot of their habitat and bring these fish back to their native waters. So being able to work closely with biologists and combine both the science and the conservation with visual storytelling is vital for giving species like lamprey a voice. And just in the short amount of time I've been able to do this, I've seen literacy for many species increase greatly. People are starting to talk about things like hellbenders and, and lamprey and freshwater mussels, and they're excited to see them in their rivers. And for, for the first time, 
many of these animals are actually being valued for their intrinsic and ecological values rather than just something maybe that you'll catch on the end of your fishing line. In many of the species I film, like lamprey and like hellbenders, the imagery produced is often the only imagery that exists for those species. Even in places like the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon, species like this endangered humpback chub go relatively unnoticed in a river that supplies water to over 40 million Americans. Because of the great burden that we place on these ecosystems, some of the most iconic fish that live in the Grand Canyons, species like razorback suckers and bony-tailed chub, are now mostly confined to the walls of, of conservation hatcheries rather than the walls of the Grand Canyon. And this is true throughout the desert southwest, where a large number of freshwater species like these desert pupfish face extinction basically from overwater allocation. So with all of us having a need for fresh water, the ability to connect people to their aquatic neighbors is crucial to save them. And one of the examples I like to, to, to share with this about people are the underwater worlds of Puerto Rico. And here you have these freshwater shrimp that live in the headwaters of Puerto Rico. And there's actually a, a river or a dam proposed on a river called the Rio Mameas. And the dam proposal was actually stopped after a biologist was able to show to a judge how important species like freshwater shrimp are. And these shrimp are actually, what they provide is this ecosystem service of, of filter feeding. They basically clean the water of Puerto Rico. So this biologist was able to show the judge that by keeping dams out, you're actually able to keep things like shrimp able to go up into their headwaters and, and basically clean the water. And so we've been working with that biologist to basically spread the word of why it's important to get freshwater shrimp up to the headwaters and from that, you can start to tell people you know, why it's important to not only not have more dams, but maybe to start to take out the old ones. So these often forgotten invertebrates provide this priceless ecosystem service to places like Puerto Rico and throughout the Americas. But in many tropical rivers, the threat of dams is now a big uh, impact for many migratory species like shrimp and like fish. The threat of dams is a great concern throughout the tropics. You know, river basins like the Amazon and the Mekong and the Congo, which support some of the greatest diversity on this planet, are now being carved up by a network of extensive dams. And the impact of dams on tropical ecosystems is actually really scary from a diversity perspective. So if you look at the, the, um, the neotropical freshwaters alone, which is the area from Mexico to Argentina, there's over 5,700 species of fish that live in that area. Now, just to put that into context, if you look at some of the most diverse marine ecosystems in the world, say the Indo-Pacific region, which has the Great Barrier Reef, there's only four to 5,000 species of fish. So these often unnoticed ecosystems represent some of the greatest diversity on this planet. And it's not just fish. From insects and mammals and everything in between, there's really the the rivers are really the hot spot of diversity in places like the tropics. And with such unique forms of life, you know, being able to connect people with these is, is a crucial tool to hopefully motivate conservation in these areas. And one of the, the great examples that I've seen of this of basically getting people to value tropical, tropical rivers and tropical watersheds is basically in the, um, the rivers of, of Costa Rica and Panama. So I talked earlier about values. Everybody has these values that they're connected with freshwater. And in, concert, in Costa Rica, there's a lot of indigenous communities that have these deep ties with this water. But they're now working with Western science, basically through these citizen science programs, to come and learn more about their rivers. And so the biologists are getting them underwater, teaching them about the fish, teaching them about the ecology of the area. And in Costa Rica, these indigenous communities actually have a say over what happens on their land. So if a dam company comes in and says, you know, we want to put a dam in because your river is unhealthy, these guys have the, basically the science to back it up. And they have the passion behind them and really that value of appreciating these underwater worlds. And so really at the heart of this story is creating new connections and values to the way you know, people see fresh water. These communities already had a deep appreciation for fresh water and the life that lived there but they gained another value when they started going underwater. And so through photo and video, I strive to convey these ecosystems, but there's really no, nothing better than getting people out and experience it for themselves. So fortunately, there's now this growing movement of people to get 
people into freshwater so they can begin to see and appreciate these freshwater worlds for themselves. And from southern Appalachia to the Pacific Northwest to the tropics, there's basically this growing movement to get people in the water. And this image is right here is actually from southern Appalachia where there's actually these guided trips that people are now taking to teach people all about the diversity that I went over earlier, showing them all these colorful fish and, and salamanders like hellbenders. So given the vital importance of freshwater to humankind, I sometimes ask myself why the conservation of freshwater isn't a more popular cause. And, but through my experience, I often see that it it's comes down to perception. You know, if, if, our, if our perception of freshwater is limited by what we see, below the, what we see above the surface, then our ability to conserve these environments is already hindered from the start. However, with so much beauty in these environments, much of it had never been filmed or photographed, I get really excited to think about the possi possibilities that exist in freshwater environments. Some of the greatest biodiversity on this planet has never been seen simply because of the reason it's below the surface. And with every human on this planet completely connected to fresh water, I believe the power to introduce communities to the, the diversity that they share their water with will be fundamental in the movement to not only conserve these environments and these species, but also conserve our most valuable natural resource, fresh water. Thank you.